Free Speech Nation. So, the last decade has seen a rise in the number of people identifying as LGBT, particularly among the youngest adults. Recent government data suggests among those under 30, as many as 20% identify as LGBT, with bisexual being the most popular, particularly among women. Here to discuss this, we have Professor Eric Kaufman from the University of London and GB News Culture and Social Affairs Editor Anaya Falorin Aman. Thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you, Eric. I'm going to come to you first, um, because you've been looking into this uh, in some depth. Can you just give us a, a, an overview of what the findings suggest? Yeah, so, so a lot of this stems from a poll from Gallup which showed that, you know, a fifth of those under, well, 25 and under, identifying as LGBT. And that's sort of a tripling uh, just really in the last sort of seven to eight years. So this tremendous increase. Yes. Uh, and so I kind of wanted to know, well, what's behind this? And there's some good survey data sets, I won't get all wonky on you, but that will allow you to, for example, look at people and people are asked, you know, how many sexual partners have you had of which, which gender? And what we find is that there's been a big rise in the number of people identifying as LGBT, but the number of people who report same-sex partners has risen much more slowly. Right. And so, so it's the identity rather yes. than the, re the, uh, the experiential reality. To the point there's twice as many identifiers in that younger group as people who've experienced same-sex partnership. And particularly amongst female bisexuals, which is the largest growth category, the share of female bisexuals who report only male partners, that is conventional heterosexual behavior, has increased from about less than one in five in 2010 to a majority now. So you have a big rise in people whose sexual behavior is conventional, but they're identifying as LGBT. Very interesting. And I, what do you make of this? Because some people would say, well, this is just a sign that we are becoming a more progressive society. So people who are from marginalized, oppressed groups are now feeling more comfortable to express themselves for who they are. Apparently three times as many are feeling more comfortable in a relatively short space of time. Do you buy that argument? I do think undoubtedly there will be an, uh, an element of that that has impacted the statistics. We do know that obviously um, historically people were stigmatised for their sexuality and therefore that would have created a negative incentive for people to come out um, as, of certain sexualities. But I do think the numbers are quite striking and there are some people that have argued that there is a social contagion element and I think um, Dr Kaufman's argument about actually whether that's identity versus how people are behaving is a very interesting phenomenon because I do think that there has been an expansion of what comes under the term queer, for example. So I've even come across young people that, for example, heterosexual um, men that may be dating women that are non-binary, so are female in their sex, but identify as non-binary, and they might identify as queer. So oftentimes, actually, if you have the traditional definition of homosexuality being same-sex attracted or heterosexuality being opposite-sex attracted, when we have gender, which is often um, described as separate to your sex and could be many different identities, then people can consider themselves queer, even if they are so, still opposite sex adjusted. So this, that, I mean, <laughs> that is really confusing because I've, I, I've seen sort of, there was one, that gay magazine cover in America saying, this is what a queer couple looked like. It was a celebrity couple. Yeah. It was a straight couple. Yeah. This is a straight couple. <laughs> and there was another one. There was um, a, an American politician's daughter came out as demisexual and therefore queer. And demisexual means that you're attracted to members of the opposite sex in a romantic way. So what that means is that if you're an old-fashioned straight, you can call yourself queer, yeah. <laughs> right? I guess so, yeah. I mean, but that doesn't make any sense. So what is it? What's going on here? Why do people want to identify into an oppressed class? Well, here's a little hint. So if you, we ask people about their political beliefs, uh, from very liberal to very conservative, using American terminology, five-point scale. Now, if you take the very liberal, that's about a fifth of young people. Within that group of very liberal, the share LGBT has gone up 22 points in, since 2010. Amongst everybody else, it's gone up six points. Okay. So really what you've got is people who have an identity as li very liberal. Uh, within that group, I would argue, within that group, a certain culture, a certain cachet is attaching to identifying as LGBT. And that explains why the increase has been so much larger amongst very liberal people compared to conservatives or moderates. So, does, so we're tying identity categories of immutable characteristics to politics. Right. Mm. Uh, yeah. OK, so well, let's talk that through a bit. I mean, because, for instance, when um, Peter Thiel, for instance, the American entrepreneur, when he appeared at the Republican convention, uh, the gay magazine, I think it was The Advocate or Out magazine, said that Peter Thiel might sleep with men, but he's not gay mm. because he's right wing. <laughs> Yeah. Like you have, <laughs> right. And then you have Joe Biden's comment about black. if you vote for if you don't vote for me, you're not black. Yeah. So 
What's going on? Yeah, so I think that that, that is the kind of <laughs> definition, really, of identity politics, where, you know, people's um, identity and how they see themselves in the world, it becomes tied with their politics. If you're a particular identity category, it's not just that you happen to be gay or you happen to be black. It must mean that you come with a particular set of outlooks and political beliefs and cultural values as well. And those who do not conform to those are often seen as less legitimate or less authentic than um, people that do of that particular identity category. And I do think it is very unfortunate. But I do think on top of that, I do think as we have become more liberal as a society, I do think there are social, um, social influences to sexuality. So I think understandably during the 20th century, um, LGBT people said that they were born this way in order to um, essentially argue that because of um, who they are, they should not be discriminated against. But I think for some people, there, are, there is evidence that, for example, they have had that kind of sexual outlook or sexual orientation from young. But for some people, I'm sure it is influenced by society as well. So, for example, we do know that, for example, mm -hmm. in the ancient times, in ancient Rome and ancient Greece, for example, there was much more homoeroticism and that was kind of valued within society and therefore more people um, particularly were drawn to that. So I can see how in today's society as well, as there are more liberal attitudes, more people can be willing to experiment sexually and experiment in their sexual orientation. And that could mean that more people are comfortable identifying um, as LGBT. So I don't just think it is um, necessarily just a fad or necessarily just because of a negative thing. No, and, you know, I don't like to ascribe anything to a fad. I think if someone tells me they're something, I will believe them. Mm -hmm. But there is something quite striking about the extent of the exponential growth. Don't, don't you think, uh, Professor Coffin, it's very big all of a sudden? Yeah, and, and you can see, again, these political correlations are very interesting. So, for example, very liberal uh, female students at top American universities who believe in shouting down speakers. Yes. Seven out of ten identify as LGBT, but those, the, the very liberal students who very much are against shouting down speakers, it's only four in ten. That's an example of where these political beliefs, particularly amongst educated young women, really seem to correlate with, you know, simply boost the share of LGBT a little bit higher. So I definitely think it's a combination of just being different is more interesting and therefore saying you're heterosexual is simply not very interesting. And also this political belief that it's kind of, you know, you're resisting some kind of power structure if you're going LGBT. Well, there's something in that. I mean, have you seen the flag for heterosexuals? You know, they've got a flag. Oh, no, well. I don't know. I didn't realise that. It's, is it, that? <laughs> I think it's just a, it's like a plain grey... <laughs> it's honestly, it may as well just be beige. Like, right, right, it's, right, it's, right. But the thing is, it's, it's, it's very much this idea, but I'm interested in this idea of, of identifying yourself into the queer category as a straight... I'm, I'm sorry, but I see a lot of straight people saying they're queer. Right, right. And they're straight. They're just yeah. straight. So, um, you know, I, I think you should have to prove it to an extent. I think, and like, that's right. I, I, I just, but don't you think that, that there's something to do with the way in which, in the modern discourse, victimhood, to be a victim and proclaim yourself a victim, come brings with it quite a lot of clout. I think that's right, and especially amongst these highly educated uh, students at elite universities, you can see that effect, mm. very pronounced. The political predicts at a very high rate. You know, if you're very liberal, you're, you're you know, almost, you know, one in two chance. So anyone taking also, uh, you know, gender studies, racial studies, it's, over, it's a majority who identifies LGBT, compared to about a quarter of all students. It's an example of this politicization. However, it is also the case that amongst less political groups like, say, black uh, women without college degrees, you are also finding an increase. And I think there it's more to do with this general culture of, you know, you want to be different. You, you don't want to be boring just like everybody else. So I think there's two things going on. One is the sort of divergence and the other is the expressly political. Isn't there something, Anaya, about, yeah. you know, how this can be quite patronising? I think if you say to someone, well, because you're gay, you're bound to vote Labour, because you're black, you're bound, bound to vote Democrat, whatever. I mean, doesn't it essentially, and this is what a problem I have with identity politics, is, is, is it eliminates individuality and the capacity for individual thought. Mm, I, think it, I think that's very true. I think, again, historically, um, the gay liberation movement was very much about, you know, this is a private matter. You know, the state should have nothing to do with, you know, what is going on in the bedroom or my romantic relationships and so on, as long as it involves consenting adults. And now, very much so, it is, um, you know, wanting to be recognised, wanting to um, be, you know, celebrated much beyond than just, for example, your own private life amongst your peers um, and, and so on. So I, I do think that, you know, this, this is the reality of identity politics. And until we go back to that very traditional and seemingly boring idea now that actually if you treat people as equals and we're all equal under the law and we are individuals, that is really um, what is most important within society. Well, ultimately, um, Professor Kaufman, does it matter insofar as does it matter if 
What if, so what if everyone's gay? Like, bring right, it on. Right. Like, it, 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 really, I mean, yeah. I mean, there would be ramifications to that, but um, <laughs> that, does it really matter how people identify? Um, well, I don't think it matters so much whether people are gay or not, but I want to bring in something else, which is this link between three things, political ideology, LGBT identity, and mental illness, okay, or poor mental health. Mm -hmm. These three... Now, I, I'm not suggesting that, that, you know... But what I am suggesting is you can look at these three questions and there is... You can explain 50% of the variation in those three questions by one factor. And what's that? In other that? words, they're heavily... Well, they're heavily connected. They're heavily correlated. So, for example, three in four LGBT teens in America uh, are persistently sad... Feel persistently sad or hopeless. Anxiety and depression levels amongst very liberal people are twice as high as amongst who are people who are just slightly liberal or moderate. And LGBT anxiety is sort of two to three times that of straight people. Now, one of the things we have to ask is, how did we get into this position? Because it looks as though the predictive power of LGBT on uh, mental illness has increased, not decreased, since 2010. Is that because... Yeah. No. no. Yeah. Is that because gay people are inherently a bit mad? Or is it, <laughs> right. is it that, right. that, that people who, who aren't gay who have problems identify themselves into that class. So here's one interesting stat, which didn't come out in the report, is people who've had same-sex experience are less likely to have the mental... Uh, you know, have depression and anxiety than people who, do, who have not had the same-sex experience. But they identify. But identify. So it's the identifying, not the practicing. And, of course, if you think about it, I mean, if it is about discrimination and, uh, and about the trauma... You'd expect the people who had the same sex experience, who were holding hands in public, who were more visible, to experience the mental illness. Whereas actually, it's the people who identify but have not had the actual same sex experience That's... that are having these much higher rates of mental illness. That's really fascinating. In particular, why, why should uh, rates of mental illness be going up amongst the community? At, at a time when to be gay has never been more widely accepted. Mm, well, this is why I think it's really important that... Um, same-sex attractedness is separated from gender identity because I think oftentimes it's kind of conflated and a lot of the issues that are involved in that are very different. So, for example, it is relatively simple if you are same-sex attracted, but, for example, being transgender often within our society may involve a kind of medical diagnosis of gender dysphoria, may involve certain, you know, treatments, uh, whether that's, you know, hormonal treatments and surgeries and so on. And there's a whole load of complexities that um, get involved in that. And I do think that when we kind of homogenise LGBT people, I think that we um, miss a lot of those nuances and complexities that actually can just mean it becomes associated with trauma, with vulnerability with something that's even medicalised, and that's not necessarily the case. Fantastic. I mean, this is a, fan a fascinating discussion. I should just emphasise, we weren't saying that gay people are mad. I was talking very much about myself. <laughs> <laughs> so